Around the world, around the clock, scientific research is conducted in the unique microgravity environment of space. It's all to benefit people on the Earth, and while this is being done in orbit, it's hardly being carried out in a vacuum. For reading off the same page with the crew every step of the way are the members of this NASA team in the Payload Operations Integration Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And as needed, thanks to this high-tech communications and data hub, so are researchers anywhere they may be around the world, around the clock. A simultaneous collaboration that knows no boundaries maximizes the benefit of this precious scientific opportunity. Payload support is but one of the jobs being done in the overall facility called the Huntsville Operations Support Center, or HOSC, located at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Providing advanced communications, data processing, and collaboration capabilities, the HOSC enables a variety of tasks to support America's space program. The development engineers responsible for the propulsion systems that launch the space shuttle to orbit carefully watch minute details of those power plants during every countdown. They bring their unrivaled expertise and years of collective experience. The HOSC is designed with flexibility to support today's and tomorrow's dynamic needs of the space community. Huntsville, this is Alpha. How are you reading? Space Lab, uh, Huntsville. John Young and Bob Crippen are one. Skylab Houston, your go for undocking. That's one small step for man. Oh, All right, uh, lift off and the clock is started. Whether you know very little about America's quest for space or are the most ardent of space buffs, this is almost certainly a collection of stories that you have never heard before. Wars in, and from the rooftops of London, one sees only revelry amid the rubble. Across the channel on the European mainland, the dust settles on a tumultuous new day. One of the first things secured here by the American Army is the brain power that launched the V-2 rocket against London and other cities. Rocket power is recognized as a strategic technology. The undisputed world champions in that arena are Germany's battle-proven rocket team, led by Dr. Werner von Braun. Liberating them and some of their rockets and bringing them to the U.S. mainland serves as yet another American victory. The U.S. Army's Operation Paperclip brings Von Braun and more than a hundred of his top scientists to Fort Bliss, Texas and White Sands, New Mexico. In 1950, the German rocket team moves to Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama, home of the Army Ballistic Missile Agency. On the world scene, New tensions grow into the Cold War between former allies, the U.S. and the Russian superpower, the Soviet Union. Both sides build nuclear arsenals. Neither has a rocket yet to lob a warhead or a satellite into orbit around the Earth. The race is on and the competition is fierce. To Ihrem Schreiben from the U.S. government has hired a number of specialists in uh, rocketry. I cannot tell you for certain if your application will succeed, but it is certainly worth an attempt. With greetings, you are Werner von Braun. Dr. Friedhoff, later known as Fred Speer, soon joined von Braun and the German and American rocket team at the U.S. Army Ballistic Missile Agency at Redstone. In a normal uh, Redstone missile test, uh, what you wanted to find out was, did the missile perform correctly? Did it reach its altitude? And in particular, what was the impact point? Because it was a military missile, you were primarily interested in, uh, did it uh, hit the um, target? And if it did not, um, during the development, what, was, what were the causes for the deviation? This whole setup of post-flight evaluation um, was organized in a way that uh, allowed 
us to do it in the shortest possible time. So we were always under this time pressure and now we had the additional task of uh, determining the orbit of a satellite. That was, um, in my opinion, the beginning of, um, of the HOSC. But in 1957, designated the International Geophysical Year, when the world's leading scientists were putting their heads together to find global harmony, these sounds, many feared might have signaled the beginning of a new world war. The U.S. was not caught completely off guard, but it sure seemed that way, as Sputnik orbited overhead every 90 minutes. America was working on launching an orbiting satellite. The Navy's Vanguard program had been selected to do the job. But to say the very least, it wasn't going well. In America's hip pocket, the Army rocket team with a modified redstone called Jupiter C and the scientific satellite Explorer 1. I promised the Secretary of the Army that we would be ready in 90 days or less. While many are well aware of how America's first satellite successfully launched into space, much less known is how these famous smiles could be so very confident that it was in orbit. How did they know it was there and so quickly after the fact? Fred Spear was a leader on the orbit determination team. As such, he was one of the first people to know for sure that America had successfully entered the space age. We uh, did not really have all the measurements that you would normally want to perform this uh, particular orbit determination. We um, had only, I believe, two stations and you need at least three to make sure that you have a complete vector. You, you really should have four stations. Didn't have them at the time. So we had a rather crude method that we had worked out with the JPL colleagues at an earlier time. And we got the data and um, it took us about 10 minutes or so to five minutes to determine that the Explorer 1 was in fact in orbit. This accomplishment was not savored long by Speer. He went to work finding a way to do this orbit determination in a better and faster way. And in so doing, he set a course that led to today's HOSC. So that led to um, the idea to establish some sort of orbit determination center uh, at the Comp Lab. The director of Comp Lab, Helmut Hölzer, was uh, very gracious and gave us uh, one of his conference rooms and made available to us the computers and the personnel that we needed to program uh, certain uh, computer programs that we needed for the orbit determination. Fletcher Kurtz was hired during the um, orbit determination days and he was very much involved in, in the uh, trajectory analysis and orbital analysis. Well, the first question was, did the satellite go in orbit after launch? And then the second question was, well, what orbit is it in? The key measurement that you made from a station was when the satellite passed the station. So you listened for the signal of the satellite, you measured the Doppler effect, uh, the whistle effect, if you know the train whistle effect as it approaches and, and leaves you, you listened for that change in frequency of the radio signal as it passed by, uh, and you measured the time that it was closest. That was the, the measurement that you got. 